as you add in your interpretation and middle management or whatever, things get, you know, construed. And like, I think had I not had that kind of rank barrier at the time major to, you know, let's just say, you know, general officer, um, had I not had that rank barrier or, or where I find myself in that position again, I would just confront that person one-on-one. -on -one, there's no miscommunication, no interpretation. Hey, and just be like, honest, hey, this is how you make me feel, you know, and, you know, and then have that conversation. And like, that's kind of one of my lessons learned in this is like, I should have addressed this way sooner and one-on-one. -on -one. And how, and if I didn't see, if, if I didn't see behavior change and then make, you know, a, a formal, you know, a, a formal complaint or whatever. Okay, on a journey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is. I mean, how how far back we go, man? Two thousand five. When's the last time I saw you? Wow. Probably haven't seen you since like oh nine ten. That's right. <laughs> so a little bit's happened between now and then. I'm assuming. A little, little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dude, it's so good to see you. So, so are you still active duty? or Are you out? I am. I'm active duty, pin lieutenant colonel this year. I'm um, at 17 and a half. Thank you. Uh, Congrats, bro! I made the mark. Um, so I can retire if I want to at 20. So that was kind of relief. Um, so yeah, 17 and a half years active duty working in the Pentagon. Well, how are you liking the Pentagon? Uh, I like it. I mean, it's a different, you know, it's overall, I like it. It's good to, to, get a sense of the building you know but i'm you know working at i'm a desk officer just kind of nugging away um and what a difference like pre-covid versus covid and the, the work that i do so um a lot of the the fun stuff the travel was kind of taken away during covid so it's just been like kind of a staff grind um the past you know 18 months or so the start of covid now are you are you infantry uh, infantry, but turned foreign area officer. So that's what I, I transitioned to foreign area officer in 2012. Got it. Okay. And how's that? How's that been? I've got a one. In fact, um, what year group are you? Oh, four. Okay. So I've got a friend who is maybe she's a captain right now, like, okay. you know, going to be Oh, four here soon. And she just got selected for, for the FAO okay deal. uh and i think she's gonna she starts that i think next year next summer she starts all her her work up and stuff okay. for the middle east is her area got it okay have you enjoyed it overall yes i mean i, I think it was i think it was a, it's a better fit for for marin and i as a couple yeah um it provided us that stability even though we moved a lot it provides that stability to have a family so about the time that i transitioned is when we started having kids um okay. so i had during that you know feo you know training type pipeline that was three years between language overseas assignment master's degree you know we had one well we were going in we had one and then our second child during that time uh so we had we we moved a lot but you know we didn't have any like impending deployments or anything and then after that timeline that was uh we served in indonesia for three and a half years and just ha ha having that stability for you know that three year period three and a half year period was 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 nice because we moved every year uh from 2010 to 16 we were had moved every wow year. yeah how was indonesia uh an adventure for sure uh so we were actually there twice so my Part of my FAO training was going to the Indonesian Army Staff College for a year. 
Um, so I learned Indonesian, went to the Indonesian Army Staff College, fully immersed. It, it was a challenge. It was probably one of the most challenging years of my life because, or my career, because I was under the authority of another military, you know, um, which is just totally different. And then, uh, you know, it was our first time as a family living overseas. So big learning curve there. Um, found out Maren was pregnant with baby number two, two weeks into it. So that was, you know, that added to it. But, and then we went back a second time and I worked in the embassy uh, doing security cooperation work. So uh, a lot different than the first experience, like first time I was a student under, you know, authority of Indonesian army essentially. Um, and then, you know, after that, you know, working in the embassy, obviously had my regular kind of chain of command and an actual job. So uh, it was, it's quite different. It was also a different location. There's more of a community there as well. So what was the biggest cultural difference between the Indonesian army and, and our army? Uh, what was the hardest to adjust? What was the, your, it's the, 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 the authority and responsibility that we're giving at a, at a very low level. Um, that just, I mean, I think we see that globally, but, you know, that's probably the biggest one. I mean, we're just given so much authority, decision-making authority, you know, in the American military where very, where you and I would grow up with very kind of low level decisions have to go up to like an 06 level that you and I can make as a Lieutenant, you know, so. Wow. So, and that, I mean, that's, that's one. Um, I think part of it was, I was a foreign student is that it wasn't for me, my experience, it wasn't a merit-based process. It didn't matter what assignment I turned in. We all got generally around the same grade, or it was like between like a 78 and an 82, regardless of quality. So it took me about a month to figure out, you know, it didn't matter how much time and effort I put into it. I was going to get about that score so that was a challenge you know adjusting to that wow that would be coming from our mm -hmm. very performance driven culture <laughs> to yes. hey it doesn't really matter you, you study you don't study you're going to yeah. get a 78 or 82 right <laughs> wow i mean I, I think another another thing as i'm thinking about this course is that we actually graded each other on you know kind of our morals it was almost like there's like a peer evaluation in there and we also got graded on our religion, um, which would not be obviously part of our system at all. So I had friends that were rating me like on a one to 10 scale saying, hey, you're a Christian, you go to church, right? Oh, you're a good Christian. Okay, we'll, we'll mark you high. Where some of my other friends like did, you know, didn't either have a religion or um, didn't go to church and they'd get like a low mark, you know? So like, that was also a really interesting aspect that would not exist, you know, in our system. Well, and how do you, that's fascinating. Yeah. How, regarding like the morals, how, 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 how do you, how do you. It's, it's kind of a perception of like how honest you are and your character as you, how you come off as like, as, as you're with, with your peers, you know, um, essentially it's just based off of, of that. So their interactions with you and, we just graded each other within our small group. Like we had a, a group of 12. Um, so, you know, you kind of just base it off of, you know, I guess how you feel about that person. That, that, that was an opportunity for them to, to also impact who would, you know, who their guy would be to like, so there's a lot of emphasis on who's the number one, number two guy out of that course. Like typically, the person who's who's ranks the highest ends up doing the best in their military, which is also not the case in our military. You can have B the B and C students still be a great general, but there, if you're number one, number two, you're gonna kind of do well in their system. Oh, interesting. So then well, you have like their classes, like their 99 and 2000 year group were kind of in competition to get their guy as number one to get taken care of down the road. Fascinating. Yeah. Wow. I, didn't, I didn't really understand that until about halfway through, you know, like you, you miss so much, you know, like I probably understood 60 to 70% of the conversations, you know, and, and, you know, some of those sensitive, com you know, conversations, like, you know, you're not going to have those unless you really kind of get to know people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Man, you know, so it, 
my my podcast is is about kind of all things related to emotional intelligence, right? And the 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 kind of entry level into emotional intelligence is self awareness, self management, social awareness, mm -hmm. and social management. Just hearing you talk, your social awareness. I, I guess I just never really put it in context of when you're learning at another in another country, and you're taking another country's you know military school mm -hmm. you, the the degree to which your social awareness has got to be like maxed out you know to try yeah. to like you said to pick up these nuances and stuff yeah. you know that's fascinating i mean that's that's super fascinating from an eq standpoint with another culture and another language that you don't you know is not your first language right that you're yeah. learning yourself on the fly yeah. like that's no joke bro <laughs> How about just like culturally, so just living over there, what type of cultural differences did you did you notice or were you aware of? Or and maybe maybe there wasn't a lot of big differences. I would say just they're quick to talk. I mean, everybody, I think generally culturally speaking, people like to talk about their family and their work, but they're also quick to talk about their religion as well. Even in like the first conversation, you know, where I feel like in America we'll be a lot more reserved about that, or you may not get that from somebody, you know, outside a church, or it may take your five conversations, right, to get there, where to them, it's just like, this is my religion, and this is just, you know, part of who I am, uh, so that's a, that's a big one, it took us a little while to adjust, so, you know, I think you find this more in developing countries, but, like, there's a guy for that, right, so there's a guy to get X, Y done, so we tend to, like, I'll use an example. I was, we were trying to buy tickets to go to like a nearby city. I'm online trying to do it all myself, you know, Google on the airline, completely frustrated. My card's getting uh, rejected. Uh, you know, things are not happening. The website is terrible. And so we had like household staff that helped marry the kids. And I was telling her about my frustrations because I couldn't get these tickets. She's like, oh, uh, my son used to work at this travel agency. It's right down the road. Let's just go down there. I went to this travel agency, gave them cash at the ATM. They printed out on this old school printer, you know, my ticket confirmation. We had tickets for that afternoon, but we had to use this travel agency and pay cash. So like, you know, our tenancy and we have the infrastructure to do so much ourselves where like, there are certain things you just can't do and you just have to find that person that does that thing, you know? So relying on your social network of friends and like, Hey, how did you do X? And they're like, go to this store, go to the second floor, go down this dark hallway. That's going to make you feel scary, scared and talk to this guy, you know? And that's how you find, that's how you make your way. You have to understand this, this, this uh, I guess, social structure, you know? Um, so it took a while to, you know, that self-reliance self and also just figuring out that guy and that system. And I think that's probably, and going back to Indonesia my second time, you know, I would call it, you know, somebody's like, that you gotta, you gotta rely, you gotta build your social network. And then you've gotta ask the questions, like also to, I think, as Americans, we tend not to like to ask for help. Um, so you get on a WhatsApp group of your 15 people and you say, Hey, where can I buy diapers? You know, and it's like, go to this mall, and, you know, and they can direct you, you know? So like you have to use that network to, to do things. Cause it's really hard to find things by yourself on your own. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Man, I love, you know, and, and, you know, uh, obviously a lot has changed in terms of being able to travel a lot is, yep. you know, is changing and stuff a lot more difficult nowadays to get places, but it, it's still, I think the, the, the point of just one's social and relational awareness, mm -hmm. especially with traveling is, is just so key because what happens is inevitably is we walk around and, and all of us, so this is not necessarily a knock, but just what happens is I walk around with my American grid mm -hmm. in whatever country I go to. And yeah. so, and so, you know, I have all those reference points and stuff. And then when I go to a country that does not have the same mm -hmm. reference points, points or files or, or, or 
re, you know, reference it. Like it, it's, you know, it's a very different and it yeah. can be a lot harder experience. Right. When I, yeah. like you said, Hey, go to go online. I should be able to look up my tickets, my travel, my lodging, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't come like, well, what, what's going on? What's the deal? Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and so then, okay, well now you've got to be a solution seeker and self-reliant yeah. like, okay, well, how would I, how do I figure this out? Well, someone's yeah. got to know, let me find some, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, just, I love that's such a great point when you're able to try. That's why I'm, I'm such a huge fan and believer in in international travel to help folks realize like the world does not revolve around the U.S. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, and I love my country. Yeah. But there's you know it just does not revolve around us. Yeah. And and you know and I've got friends that haven't left my little town I grew up in in little Podunk Illinois. Yep. And they their worldview is you know, is the size of a postage stamp. And anyway, mm -hmm. it's just that just a really neat experience that you had there. Okay, now let's get down to the in, in, in the way natural Libre would say the needy greedy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a classic movie if you have not. If you have not seen it. I'm trying to remember, I think I've seen parts of it, but I don't think I've seen it all the way through. Oh, bro, bro. That is I'm classic. Classic American filmmaking right there. <laughs> That's my first note. <laughs> I told I told my 14-year-old daughter that I'm gonna be Nacho Libre for, for Halloween, and she's like, no. <laughs> like that is my character, man. That dude right there. <laughs> okay, so toxic leadership. Uh-huh. I know nobody has any experience with this yeah. other, other than you and me. So obviously a very relevant topic, mm -hmm. whether you're military, whether you're civilian, you're corporate America, it doesn't matter where you're at. Mm -hmm. There are toxic leaders out there. Yeah. And in my opinion, one of the factors and and components that drive that toxic leadership is an emotionally unhealthy individual yes right just my yeah. background now being in emotional intelligence and stuff now yeah. is that the case every time maybe not but i will tell you probably by and large a lot of the scenarios with toxic leaders is you are dealing with or interacting with somebody that has a low emotional intelligence yeah. and and so you it sounded like you did a facebook post for those of you all that are listening on our podcast or watching on our youtube channel travis did a post recently on facebook on a certain leadership experience that he had and he had a lot of great insights and reflection and and lessons learned and i think that's another very powerful aspect of encountering or being under the influence of toxic leadership Mm -hmm. is how do you let that affect you right cheesy quote time hashtag cheesy quote time i i love some great quotes mm -hmm. is you can allow that to make you bitter or better mm -hmm. and so anyway can you please describe with as much detail as you can safely yeah. and comfortably and stuff mm -hmm. what was the toxic leader experience that you had and then what were your some of your corresponding insights it was you know one of my senior level bosses you know there was just kind of like this dis disrespectful treatment you know like I mean, I, i've been in the army been sworn at you know since i was like in you know high school you know football coach like i'm used to that i've had very many uh angry italians in in my life in in pennsylvania and through the army you know so I, it, like, I don't get offended by like cursing and, and that type of thing, but it was more like the kind of like a humiliation and just frustration walking away. Um, and of course, like my first couple of months, I just internalized it. I'm like, oh, I got to get better. This is all my fault. Like I wasn't prepared. My boss didn't feel prepared. You know, I, like just internalize it. Okay. What do I, what do I need to do to get better? Um and I would say it really started to escalate during COVID because there just weren't very many of us in the office. I felt like I, I started observing him treating others that way. And it got worse when he like kind of thought he was alone. It usually happened with at the lowest level, not like the middle management. 
And then I had one of my peers after I, you know, uh, after he kind of gave it to me for, for whatever reason, when my peers came over and she's like, hey, you know, you handle that pretty well. You know, we've actually kind of reported this, you know, to our, you know, our section. And after that, I'm like, okay, I, I realized, okay, it's not just me, you know? So like, I guess I went through that. It must be a problem with me, but I realized it's, 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 it's more of him than it is me. But again, that took me a couple months to kind of sort through that. And it wasn't until a peer really brought that to my attention. Um, and then I felt a little bit more empowered, actually. I'm like, you know what? If it's more than me, like I, I, I feel like I have more, I have more strength and courage to defend others than I do just myself. Mm. So that's, I would say, probably took me a couple of weeks until then I reported it through my, you know, chain of command. And more, it was more like, hey, um, just in case I get fired, this is what's been going on. Like, you know, like I know he's not happy with me, but there's more to it than that. So that was kind of the initial three, four, five months. And then, um, that was kind of the initial experience. Um, and then I, you know, put on my Facebook post. I, I still, I was, but I, then it kind of transitioned. I was still kind of bitter and frustrated about it. I was angry. I still get every emotion. So that's when Marin encouraged me to get counseling, to talk to somebody about it. And that's when I did. And it helped out a lot. It ended up, you know, what was being triggered to, to me, like in that, because I like, I just had all this like kind of fear. The fear was like, preventing me from talking to him to going to his office but it was like it was I felt like it was so much bigger than like what was going on between us and that's what really the counseling unveiled it took me back to childhood memory when I was nine years old you know afraid of uh you know you know family situation that I was in and I got healing with that and I'm like oh wow you know like how incredible so you know fast forward four or five months later he ends up moving on and and now especially now I'm more far removed the more I talk about it I actually have compassion for him now that's kind of where I'm at because you know like kind of what you said earlier people who have who are like unstable emotionally like people treat people like that because that's how they've been treated and like what what got him to that point what's his relationship with his boss his previous bosses where did he culturally where did he grow up what's his relationship with like his dad like you know who knows like how did he get to that point to think it's okay to just basically cut people down like trees so uh, that's kind of where i am specifically kind of with that individual and that was kind of probably took me a good from start to finish at least a year to kind of get to that point you know um like i would say where i'm i'm not angry anymore but i'm compassionate you know and i guess that i've been on this theme of trying to be triggerless right like i don't want to have you know i want to be able to if i'm uncomfortable of my boss whether he's a two-star or four-star whatever i'm i'm and it gets to a point where i feel like it's like he's disrespecting me as a human being I need to be able to say something you know and say something earlier so that's kind of my uh, you know a summation of kind of what I shared on Facebook that's that's excellent and there's a truckload of insights and questions and trails that we can go down well I would I would argue that the majority of us handle stuff the way that you did and I'll speak for myself, I have handled toxic leaders similarly, where I, I would, number one, I would initially just let them roll over me. Mm -hmm. Well, man, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm, I am that ate up and this, you know, yeah. waste of oxygen and all this stuff, right? All, all the different, the scripts that can, can, can kick in from those experiences. And, 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 and part of my kind of stuff that I learned as a child was, well, a couple of learned a lot of stuff, but one is how to stuff and avoid mm -hmm. my feelings and emotions, number one. So which number two, what that left me was completely emotionally unaware. So mm -hmm. when someone was would be abusing me, so to speak, verbally, mainly emotionally, I, I, I wouldn't even really be aware of it. Yeah. And just like, you know, I just I, I wouldn't even be aware of, of what's going on inside. What are the consequences of that treatment? And, and, and then even if I did get some emotion, like, okay, that didn't feel right, I would immediately stuff it and avoid it because I didn't have the tools. Well, okay, if I did pull out anger or 
rage or frustration or sadness or disappointment, I, I wouldn't have known what to do with it if I pulled it out. What do I do? Like, okay, now I'm I, I'm letting myself feel this anger. Well, crap, I, I may gorilla stomp this guy. I may throat punch the dude, right? I, I don't know, right? I have no idea. I could go in Incredible Hulk mode. Uh, and and then lose all which which I have I have done before. So and and one of the things too, and I and I've got a question for you because I'm really and this is really a a, a genuine question for me personally uh, because one of the dynamics of me growing my emotional intelligence over the past three to four years is I have started to learn a concept that I have never even heard of prior to three or four years ago, and that's the concept of boundaries. My hmm. family of origin never had any boundaries. Yeah. We, you know, we, we never had any boundaries. And so I grew up, I, did, I, I literally, until three or four years ago, had never even heard of the word boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and did not realize how many boundaries I violated, yeah. how many people I allowed to violate my bound, right? I mean, yeah. and so, and so the things you're want, you're, you're, so you're working on is something that I want to work on too, that if I had someone violate my boundaries, and the other thing too I had going on, so I'm jumping around here, mm -hmm. is my people pleasing addiction. Yeah, I've been a people pleaser addict for as long as I can remember. Yeah. And so I definitely would not express my boundaries and or enforce my boundaries. Because well, well, you know, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to offend them. Maybe it is me, right? All those different things. And so I, I'm, I'm finally I feel like I'm, I'm getting to a place where if someone did violate a boundary, I would be able to stop them immediately and say, Whoa, whoa, whoa hey, General Jones, Hey, let's let's pump the brakes here. I appreciate your professional perspective. Can we check out kind of how you're communicating right now? Because if, if it continues like this, I, I'm going to go ahead and walk out right now until you come back and you tell me when to come back and we can talk like human beings, totally yep. down to hear correction and how I need to improve, but but not with a decibel level yep. beyond our normal talking voice, right? And, and if I get fired, I get fired, but homie does not care what rank you are anymore. I don't care what, but back in the days yeah. it was yes, boss. Yes, boss. Whatever you say, boss. Oh, you're a higher rank than me. So I have to do mm -hmm. no, no. Yeah. You put cause now dude, I got classmates that are generals, bro. So now I'm like, Oh no, 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 dude. Mm -hmm. No, I, I knew you were, you're a punk little cadet dude. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So here's my specific question. And then let's, I want to continue the conversation. Do you feel like, and, and I'm asking genuinely, cause I, I don't, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm really curious. Would, would it be helpful to you and, or that guy, if you told him how you, how you, how he made you feel? Yes. I mean, I, no, I, I absolutely um, feel like that would, I mean, it would be helpful because you know, even when, so I reported it and my chain of command brought it to his attention because they had enough signals and he was like, totally unaware. He was absolutely unaware, you know? And, uh, and so I, you know, and I mean, we didn't really see a behavior change afterwards. He tried to like not swear as much, you know? Um, that was kind of his way of like trying to fix himself. But yeah, no, I think uh, absolutely. And like, we had like a farewell call. He, he called up like his last day or two. And I'm like, and I knew, I'm like, hey, listen, I'm sorry that I never earned your trust and confidence. Like, and I, like, I, I, I knew I hadn't, you know, and, and he's like, I mean, he had like positive words to say, you know, following that, you know, but I didn't get into, and I, I thought about it too, because I'm like, as you add in your interpretation and middle management or whatever, things get, you know, construed. And like, I think had I not had that kind of rank barrier at the time, major to, you know, let's just say, you know, general officer, um, had I not had that rank barrier or, or where I find myself in that position again, I would just confront that person one-on-one. -on -one, there's no miscommunication, no interpretation. Hey, and just be like, honest, Hey, this is how you make me feel, you know, and, you know, and then have that conversation. And like, that's kind of one of my lessons learned in this is like, I should have addressed this way sooner and one-on-one. -on -one. And how, and if I didn't see, if, it, if I didn't see behavior change, 
and then make you know a, a formal you know a, a formal complaint or whatever um so yeah no, absolutely okay so man okay so a couple other thoughts so so one is that is semi terrifying not surprising being that i was in the army as well many many moons ago that you've got a guy who is that senior and that clueless when you've got someone that high up on the food chain that has no awareness, mm -hmm. no self-awareness and no social awareness. Wow, bro. Right. Think about, and, and then you throw into it. So, so obviously, so little to no self-awareness, little to no social awareness. And then you add into that clearly little to no self-management skills. Mm -hmm. Dude, that's, that's three out of the, well, and, and clearly poor social management skills right with how he treated his team yeah dude you got a that's like one of the worst combinations you can possibly have is lots of rank lots of power lots of position and no eq mm -hmm. that's a dangerous leader in my opinion and and maybe at best you've got a very toxic culture mm -hmm. so maybe dangerous is a little bit too extreme or provocative toxic yeah. culture right when you've got a whole team of people that are afraid to to well and here's the other thing too that people don't think about so you got this toxic dude and then based on how many people he had on his staff that's five people 10 people 15 20 people that now are all going home with this very intense energy going on from this very toxic leader bringing them to these 15 to 20 other families and children and then the children go to school and the, the spouse right, like it's compounding right the yeah. the compound mm -hmm. effect and impact of someone with low eq mm -hmm. i mean it can be catastrophic in some cases dude yeah. check this out you'll appreciate this in a in a non good way i talked to a battalion commander in the 82nd a number of years ago and and i asked him i said hey have you seen in my, it was in my old, he was my old, he was in my old battalion uh, um, and he was a commander and he, and, and Lieutenant Colonel five. And, and I asked him, I said, have you ever seen any poor decision-making on the battlefield in combat as a result of personality conflicts? He said, dude, are you joking me? He said, absolutely. Yeah. He said, I'll tell you one right here. I'll tell you one of my, one of my deployments. I had the, my brigade commander and the CG had a total hardcore personality conflict. And as a result, one of the two made a very, in my opinion, poor decision that cost 72 soldiers their lives. Oh, geez. And I'm like, as a result of low EQ, mm -hmm. personality conflict, yeah. we're talking life changing decisions, mm -hmm. right? So that's why for me, Dude, this, and I thank God that I started on this journey. I, I wish I had started 20 years ago, but I'm thankful I started it four years ago because yeah. it's been life-changing for me. And, and, and I'm also thankful for what it sounds like, the new command system in the Army, it sounds like they are starting to come around to their, you know, this new command system and stuff that they're coming into this, mm -hmm. where it's, it's more, hey, emotional intelligence and how aware are you of your own self and others? Mm -hmm. Right. And so how like long term, Travis, has this experience with this senior leader impacted your own leadership, personal and emotional growth journey? Well, I mean, I think uh, leadership wise, I mean, obviously, it's like obvious to me, like this is not a good behavior. And I, I think, you know, kind of growing up, you know, in the army, you know, the the poor leaders that you have usually have more of an impact on your leadership style than the good ones. Mm -hmm. Like you see a good one, you're like, oh, I want to model that. But then you have a really bad one that just stings. And you're like, I am not going to do that. You know, so like, so I mean, and, and that, I mean, I would say kind of leadership wise, personally, I think I told you um, uh, being triggerless, you know, so getting to a point where whether it's, you know, getting to a point where I'm basically fearless, right? I mean, that, that's kind of for me where I want to be, right? 
not being afraid of one, just a personal conflict, having a, having a difficult conversation, being vulnerable with somebody that may reject you, you know, and for me, and that, that's all, you know, that, that post that I, you saw like two weeks ago, I, I sent an email to about 20 people in my organization that hit those points and got even more personal, just it, it, not, it, it was, it was exercise of faith for me. It was be vulnerable, you know, I mean, there's a whole spiritual component that I could, you know, go down, you know, that's like another hour conversation, you know, but for me kind of spiritually is facing my fears and that's part of my, like, and now I kind of, I think I hit it on the, you know, my walking this out, right. This journey is share is being vulnerable, not worrying about judgment of others, which was also a big one. And just this theme that has been, you know, I've, I've been keying in on the last 10, 11 months, like how much, like I haven't posted stuff publicly because I was afraid that people were going to disagree with me or people were going to judge me or whatever. So, I, I mean, I think it kind of gets to your point, you know, the people pleasing, like I never thought of myself as a people pleaser, but I never wanted to offend anybody. Even if it was like my core belief, I'll just keep it to myself, you know, like, and just, you know, my actions, I want my actions to be in line with what I believe, but like, I'm not going to be outspoken on X, Y, or Z, especially publicly. So we're now, I'm, I feel like with the things that I have conviction on and that I feel like I need to share, I'm just going to share those, be vulnerable and the judgment's going to come and, and let it be. So that's kind of where I am in this journey. I think so that kind of leadership and personally wise, and, you know, this has caused me to, you know, face other fears. Like I, you know, um, you know, within my church, I'm like, I was feeling like I needed to like participate more. So I joined like the prayer group and I'm like taking, you know, steps of faith there with that and being more bold with my own personal prayers and prayers for other people. So kind of spiritually, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I think that the underlying thing here is more like spiritual than it is like, cause I just feel like COVID, this whole thing, because like it's impacted, you know, my middle management leadership still to this day, how they perceive me, which I don't think is, I'm still living with that, which is not fully true, quite honestly. So I'm still living with that, you know, but I just feel like there's just been this stirring of norms and our identity and, you know, all of that stuff, COVID or not, it has provided that time for reflection um, so I've been doing a lot, a lot of like reflection, you know, and, and, uh, so anyway, I don't, I think, I don't know, does that answer your question or not? Oh, absolutely, bro. And, and so it's so funny that you, you brought in the spiritual aspect. I just got done to just right before this interview with a, a four hour course called emotionally healthy discipleship by yeah. Pete and Jerry Scazzaro. Highly, highly recommend it. He wrote a book called emotionally healthy spirituality and the tagline on the book dude is a throat punch he says the tag the, the tagline on his book is it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature mm. which has yeah. literally been the story of my life <laughs> i have been i have been spiritually immature because because of my my emotional immaturity mm. I, it's it, it, it you know what I'm saying and, and my my faith my marriage my parenting my decision making my everything has changed as a result of of me giving God access to to my emotions and feelings yeah. which he gave me right but but how many how many churches how many services have you ever been to that anybody in the church and however long you've been going to church has ever talked about feelings and emotions yeah but yet we wonder why are so many people that love Jesus so emotionally dysfunctional or so dysfunctional? Yeah. Because how many of us have been trained on how to, you know, be aware of, identify, manage, and process our own emotions? Yeah. Slim to none of us, right? And so, and so I, I there I, and I never re, I never knew that they're connected. Our mm -hmm. emotional health is connected mm -hmm. to our spiritual health yeah. and vice versa. I never knew that there was a connection there. And, and, and dude, and your point, so, so you did some massive work. So here's the other thing too. I want to give you mad props for your vulnerability and transparency for being 
no. being on the podcast and letting me talk to you about some of the stuff that's, you know, sensitive and vulnerable and transparent and, you know, maybe un uncomfortable and stuff. And I appreciate that. And one of the things that he just got on saying, the guy in the course, he said, uh, Pete Scazzaro said, you, you can't, you can't manage what you're not aware of. Yeah. You can't manage what you're not aware of. So now talking about it helps. That's, that's yeah. part, I've got a whole, I've got a whole system that I tell folks to start their emotional fitness program and it's called yeah. go aped and uh, acknowledge, give yourself permission to feel, uh, express, and then, and then discuss there, there's, there's, there's healing power in just talking about it. You go into your, your counselor, your therapist, mm -hmm. dude, me, I've been a counselor therapist for a year, year and a half, maybe more. And just the, the healing power. Right. But, but all society, Oh, oh I don't know. You know, this mm -hmm. dude is crazy. Right. But, yeah. Oh, this dude, this is another money one. Since this experience this past year, how do you feel your your leadership has changed as a result of of this discovery of 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 this experience this past year how ha have you changed as a leader so i think the the biggest one for me um so i'm not one to kind of toot my own horn i i don't know if it's humility false humility or what but like i generally like watch what i do i'm not going to talk about what i do but it's just this recurring theme of advocating for myself, you know, and having, if there's a misperception, if, you know, if, you know, I'm being treated in an un unhealthy way, I need to self-advocate, you know, which I wouldn't do in the past or I, or, you know, or unless, and I guess the other tricky part is when I'm close to my leadership, it's like, like there's a caring, there's a lot more room for advocating, having those honest conversations. I've had those with previous leaders and it just doesn't, didn't really exist, you know, because uh, I just don't know how much there was true care of how you actually feel. But like, whether they care or not, I still need to advocate for myself. And I, I, and I guess for me also understanding, you know, that, they have a point of view and I also have a point of view and truth is somewhere in the middle. It may be one way or the other, but my point of view still matters because it's my point of view, right? So, um, and I think it, it's sometimes like when you're in those situations, you just think, well, that person's right and I'm wrong. <laughs> it's just like, they have a point of view. I've got a point of view and let's talk about it. And maybe we meet in the middle, maybe we disagree, but like, I think, respecting my own point of view on things, you know, my own opinion about it. So self-advocacy, my point of view, um, and certainly emotion, like I've, I've been kind of going, I don't know if it's a stage of life thing, more, maybe it's our society allowing males to have acceptable emotions that are more than just anger, right? Like it's cool for a male, we can, we can, hey, this guy made me angry. I got in a fight, blah, blah, blah. But like, 10 years ago, we wouldn't say, this guy really made me sad. You know, like you get made fun of, like you don't right. talk about those, what we would probably call feminine feelings back in the day where now we can talk about, you know, the spectrum of feelings, right? Where I think it's more socially acceptable, especially for males, you know? So one thing that was, I, I follow Kerwin Ray, who um, does a lot of speaking, Australian guy, he's on social media. Um, he, he, get, and this really helped me. This is a really good visual for emotions. He's like, he's like, with your emotions, positive, negative, he's like, he's like, think about it. Like, think about it as your kids in the car, you can't put your emotions in the trunk, right? But you can't put them in the driver's seat. You put them right in the middle. Like, and I treat now emotions more of like a signal or, Hey, this is a, something's going on. You got to pay attention to it. It's like a warning light but it can't drive your decisions. Right. So, and, and like, so kind of, and then like, you know, so that's, that's kind of where, how I've been kind of developing. Dude, love it. Love it. And, and I love that analogy. One, one that I use is it, it, you know, emotions are just your, it's, it's your dashboard. It's just learning to read your dashboard on your car. When, when the, when the, the line goes to E that's not, you don't get mad at your car. You don't get upset at your car. You don't, well, man, the E sucks. The E's terrible. No, no. Like, thank God that there's an E sign yeah. 
yep. because now now you know that okay i need to go get gas well yep. that's what our emotions are they're not good or bad they're it's data it's information yep. and and most of us have just never learned how to read the balance sheet of our emotions yep. you know how do we budget our emotions how do we manage how do we you know process this stuff and so that's why i think there's so much dysfunction in our world today yeah. And, and, and yeah, there's so many things, dude. I'm so stoked. The other thing I was thinking about when you when you were talking is the impact that this new awareness that you have, Travis, is is going to impact and change the trajectory of your children and your marriage, bro. Yeah. Like, and this is something I've thought about for you know again the last few few years I've been thinking about this stuff all the time. What was the impact of Noble pre EQ as as a dad on my daughter? Mm-hmm. what is going to be the impact of of post eq you know now working on my eq intentionally every day how has my daughter's life changed and, and you know in in ways that she's not even aware of right so and i just i mean dude just that point like hey i'm, I'm advocating for myself more mm-hmm. dude that's massive yeah because you, I, I did the same thing like oh my vote doesn't count. I don't matter. Like, oh, everyone else's input is more. Again, people yeah. pleaser addict, right? So, which is total textbook. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, hey, what do you think, Noble? Oh, it's, I was Gilligan, bro. I was totally. Oh, yeah, hey, that's a good idea. Oh, oh no, that's a good idea. Oh, that's a good. Noble, what do you think? Oh, uh, whatever you guys think, right? I never, you know what I mean? I never would come up with my own opinion or because uh, I, I wanted to be loved. I wanted that validation. I wanted the affirmation. I wanted the approval. I would tell you, oh, no, bro. My identity is in Christ, bro. Oh, 100 mm-hmm. percent. No, no, no. I just knew that because that was the right church thing to say. Yeah. I-, I wasn't living that way. I was living like my identity is in the opinions of everybody. Yeah. This is one thing, dude. This is massive. One thing that has been massive for me that has been a great confirmation of growth for me in my journey so far is that now, for the first time in my life over the past few years, haters and haterade don't impact me at all Mm -hmm. and praises and loverade or whatever doesn't it doesn't impact me either neither one yeah right i appreciate if someone says oh noble man i really love you bro i appreciate you hey thank you totally appreciate that someone says nobody hates you you're a waste of skin waste of oxygen thank you for Mm -hmm. communicating your but dude it doesn't it doesn't change my value. Yeah. Whereas before my identity and value yeah. was in the hands of everyone else around me. Mm-hmm. And now finally, I really genuinely feel like, no, no, my identity genuinely now is in the Lord yeah. and not in people anymore. And so now I can live a very, very different life mm-hmm. based on that grid by itself where yeah. hate and praise don't affect me anymore. Yeah. You know, which is because both one would crush me, mm-hmm. one hate would crush me, crush my soul, yep. would take me out for weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. And, and same thing, if someone praised me, oh, noble, you're the greatest guy I've ever met in my life. Oh, my, oh, like I'd ride that way. Oh, my, I must be amazing then, right? No, 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 no. no. I know I've got strengths, yep. I know I've got weaknesses, mm-hmm. and both do not define me yep. because I know who I am and whose I am. And mm-hmm. that's, that's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is, tra- it's, that's transformational, bro. That yeah. is transformational. No, I, Have you yeah. seen any impact in this growth journey in your marriage and or parenting as a result of this experience? So, I mean, yes, you know, marriage, right? So as I'm talking to uh, Marin about this, she's like looking at me like, are you kidding me? I'm like, and then I'm like feeling this personal conviction, like, oh, maybe I was treating her not to the same degree, but she was not feeling safe with me sometimes based off of my own behavior or conversations, or maybe I was being too harsh or overbearing. And I had, I, and I was clueless to that. Right. So, so like, I'm like telling, I'm kind of complaining to her and she's just like, mm, really, you know? <laughs> so so, I mean, for me now, I mean, so I am aware of, of, you know, more of certainly aware of, you know, my harshness, you know, when I come across things, I think, 
So I'm like, I think I'm a better listener, you know, through this as well. I always thought I was a pretty good listener, but, you know, having talked and, you know, having talked to Mayor, not as good as I thought I was, you know, so like it's, it's, it's helped me become more of aware. Um, I think we're, our, we're communicating more clearly. Um, as I remove like some of these kind of deep triggers, like, and like we've had a little bit more stability because our transition back to the US, like, was actually pretty hard. Like, there, there's like backstory to the toxic leadership, you know, so that's a whole kind of separate conversation. So we're both kind of just more stable anyway, more resilient. So, like, now we can talk about these uncomfortable things, you know, where we transition back to the US, like just trying to get plugged back into American society. We bought a house. She didn't like it, you know, it caused marital stress. Like, so like that, she had a, she had a, you know, we had an experience a miscarriage, which was like devastating. So all of that was kind of pre, you know, this toxic leadership. So I was not in a great place, you know, mentally and emotionally leading to this, you know, so um, we're, you know, two and a half years since we transitioned back, we're just, we're in a much better place, you know, so I would say, you know, that, and like I said, kind of like, I, I, I kind of, I like where you are, I like, you know, I, I that's kind of where I want to be, you know, like, not worrying about the negative judgment, but not allowing the praises to, to dry, to, you know, to influence me, you know, too much too. And I would consider it like you're kind of emotionally bulletproof, right? So that's kind of where, where I would like to be, you know, that's my, you know, I would say my goal, you know, and I, I do feel like, you know, who knows what my future can look like on leadership, but just like utilizing social media podcasts or whatever content production, like you've got to be okay with the negative, right? And you can't let the positive build you up, you know? So like, as you, as you're trying to influence your community, you know, you got to be prepared for that, you know? So I feel like I'm being prepared for a, a season of, of this in the future, have no idea what it looks like, um, you know, whether it's continuing the military or post-military, but getting to that point where I'm kind of emotionally bulletproof, you know, and I mean, it could be, you know, like, I think I, I think it's, it prepares you more for like the public, you know, with our social media, because the public can be ruthless, right? And you, you've got to be prepared to expose yourself like that and, and not, not let it tear you down for a month you know so that's right yeah. well here's a, a great thing that i that i've learned over the over the years these last few few years and, and even before that is this is that hurting people hurt people yes so yeah. you, you you know your your boss you know you know your your previous boss clearly was emotionally dysfunctional clearly emotionally dysfunctional yeah. well that comes from somewhere right and all yeah. of our all of us lottie dottie everybody mm -hmm. we get our emotional foundation from our childhoods everybody yeah. Yeah. Whether you had Leave It to Beaver or you had Jerry Springer, yeah. either way, we get our emotional foundation from our childhoods. Yeah. And what, you know, again, and reg regardless of how, how, whether or not we're aware of, of how our childhood has impacted us, it does. One of the things I've learned from, been coaching now for a long time, 100% of my clients, whether they're 60 or 70 or 16, whether they were net worth of 70 million or 20,000, every single one of my clients exhibits and has exhibited behaviors as an adult as a direct result of their childhood. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. Now, so, so what that did for me was, because I'm like, oh, wow, this is, man, man, thanks, God. That was a big epiphany, big, big, you know, whatever, revelation, whatever, connection. And then I was like, you know, God drops the old mirror down in front of me. So how about you, bro? <laughs> like, what behaviors am I exhibit? Because I had a pretty, for you know, for the most part, a leave it to beaver childhood in today's terms. Yeah. Um, but, but everyone, the other thing I like to say is no one leaves their childhood unscathed. Nobody. Even if you had leave it to beaver, yeah. nobody, which is an old TV show for all you young kids that are listening to this or watching this right now. It's an old Another TV show. Another reference. <laughs> <laughs> so... Nobody leaves their childhood unscathed. We all leave our childhood with emotional baggage. Just how much, how, how, are, how aware are we of it? And to what degree is it impacting us? And mm -hmm. if we don't go back and heal those areas, like 
thank God how how there's a silver lining in this toxic leadership experience that allowed you to realize, oh, snap, part of that trigger was from my childhood when I was nine years old. Yeah. Dude, that is the power of emotional growth and emotional healing. Yeah. And now you, you come across another another toxic leader, it's not going to have the same impact on you anymore. Yeah. Right. So it, mm -hmm. the power of emotional growth and emotional healing is otherwise emotionally, you know, this is not the right word, you know, uh, uh, um, provocative, you know, events or experience, or whatever, are they don't have that power over you anymore. Yeah. They don't have that control over you anymore emotionally. So the next toxic leader comes along, they're not going to have, it's not going to, you're going to be cool as pond water. Mm -hmm. Hey boss, check this out. Let me know when you calm down and, and then I'll have a chat with you. What? I can't, I'll be back. See ya. Mm -hmm. And you walk out the door yep. and let that, because what's happening is mm -hmm. that dude was having a tantrum. Yeah when they were 12 years old or seven years old or four years old, they never healed from that. So that's what a tantrum looks like in a 40 year old body. Yeah. That, you know what I'm saying? So yes. dude, I'm just so stoked about this journey that you've, that you've, you know, jumped on because I do for me, it's been, it's been life changing for me. Yeah. And it's just neat how, again, this is actually one of my next tattoos how God recycles all our crap yep. if we let him. Yep. So again, a potentially very negative experience yep. and you, you, you are a different man as a result. No, if I could elaborate on that, I think I made a couple of points to, to that references and other, I don't know if I made specific reference to scripture, but there's the Marcus Aurelius one, like the obstacle is the way so like for, for, for me right now, fear is the way, you know, addressing what, what is my fear, getting to the, the root of it, and then like taking that action step, the next step, the next step, you know, so like, and then also kind of spiritually, where we have victory, we have authority, right? So my testimony is somebody else's prophecy. So, and that's where I'm at in, in this phase, where honestly, like, I feel like if I'm, if I don't take these steps and share my testimony, I may not, I won't get the full healing. I won't get the full experience of this. So I have to now share, you know, my testimony and, and, you know, I, I actually talked with that counselor a couple, maybe six months ago and, and that, and I kind of, you know, we both felt like it was on our heart to, to share this. And, and I'm like, I don't know. She's like, opportunities will present themselves like don't like overthink it so i've done it individually i've done it in a you know an email with 20 people i did it with my face community and now i'm doing it with you and you know whoever you know whether it's one person or 500 you know like now it you know it's just up to me to, to share and and also like here's the other thing too noble is that i'm constantly trying to like watch my and in, my intentions right we don't know our true intentions we like the intentions of our own heart right so i'm constantly trying to make sure that i'm in the right place that i'm not doing it to like speak ill of somebody or or or, or, or an organization and bring hate it's really like i want my true you know motivation to be like an encouragement for others take the steps don't you know don't you know handle all this emotional stuff on your own, you know, life is a team sport, you know, all of that. Like you gotta, when you need help, ask for it, get it, get it. And then, so that, so anyway, that's kind of, that's kind of, you know, my, re, you know, a couple points that I wanted to add on to that. Love it, bro. Thank you for sharing all that. So, so if, if somebody has a question about your growth or your journey, your experience, what's the best way they can follow you? How do they find you? How do they follow you? How can they ask you a question or something? I'm on Facebook, probably the most, the most regularly, you know, so DM on a Facebook messenger, like you got in touch with me. A final question. What advice would you give to other leaders out there, whether they're junior, mid-level senior leaders about their own emotional growth journey? or their own growth journey as a leader? I mean, I guess for me, um, it's, it, you know, advice for myself, for them, pay attention to your triggers, pay attention to those, 
it's, it, it, you know, when you have these emotions, you know, it's like, does this small event trigger this massive, you know, an un, this unweighted, you know, pay attention to that. There's something there. You may not know what it is, but do you have a short fuse on this really small, small thing? Or is that like, let's just call it anger. Is that anger emotion the same as something terrible and is something, you know, very small? So pay attention to those things that have disproportionate triggers, right? And 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 chase them and, and find out about them. And like the, the, the word that has been coming to mind as I reflect on this is take inventory. Start taking inventory of those, you know, disproportionate triggers. They mean something. It's it's a sign. So pay attention to those signs. Um, and then when it comes to, so that's kind of the individual piece. And when it comes to, you know, being a leader of an organization, you know, a lot of people say they care, right, about their people. You got to make time for your people. And then so even if that's, you know, you look, maybe it's a large organization. Find 15, you know, find 15 minutes a week. Take you know, that, you know, your subordinate, whoever, out for coffee and understand what they want. Under, and, 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 you know, listen to what, what they actually want. You know, and then like understand if you're in that organization long enough, the, I'm kind of stealing some of this from uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who I follow a lot, but like understand what the 20 year old version wants and then what the 28 year old version wants because that's probably changed when you add in a spouse or a child or what that 35 year old wants maybe it's more life life balance so like under truly understanding what your folks want but you have to take the time to understand that you know so um anyway those are you know kind of individual one and then one for the larger organization love it bro awesome skinny and, and something that's neat too, you talk about the triggers we have in our EQ Mafia, if you're watching on YouTube, there's our, you know, we've got my sign in the back there. In the EQ Mafia, we have a couple of different trainings that we've done on how to evaluate and assess your triggers and how to break them down and, mm -hmm. you know, the ramp up and okay. you know, the signs and, you know, processing afterwards and questions to ask yourself and that kind of thing. Um, cause that is such a great, that's a great exercise, Travis. I mean, just, just saying, Hey, I mean, that was a great advice. Hey, what are the areas like where, where you have an exorbitant response for, you know, where, where the, 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 the time doesn't reflect the crime, so to speak, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? um, mm -hmm. and, and, and to, to like pay attention. And I love that just paying attention to those. That's excellent. So anyway, bo the bottom line is, dude, awesome. Really appreciate your, again, your vulnerability, your transparency. And what I know is, dude, you've done some deep work because of the connections that you're, that you've made. Mm -hmm. And some of those insights, those mm -hmm. are not surface level insights. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the result of you doing some really good meaty work, dude, which is life changing, man. Yeah. It is. I'm so excited, dude how how this is going to change and has already changed the trajectory of your your leadership your your faith your marriage your parenting yeah. right all these different areas man so stoked bro so yeah. thank you so much for your time brother yeah absolutely no and i i appreciate your vulnerability and your mission you know educating people on emotional intelligence i think it's very very important and and i don't know i would argue probably more the, one of the more relevant topics of leadership for for the decades to come.